Hello friends, I hope this uh, time finds you well and blessed and thankful and um, it's good to be with you and uh, glad that you tuned back in to another session. Uh, we started this new series last week uh, entitled The Quest for Wisdom, Life's Most Precious Commodity. We sort of introduced that idea last week and uh, invited your feedback, got quite a bit of feedback, thankful for that, about uh, what directions we go in the future and so forth. We're still in this in this broadcast laying a little bit of groundwork and that kind of thing, but uh, we'll review a bit what we did the first time and then get into some new thoughts. Uh, but again, I, I uh, encourage you to let me know uh, maybe some questions you have or your responses to some of the things we're talking about. I invite that, and that's the way I prefer to do things um, and look forward to being able to do that face-to-face -face, uh, as normal soon. Uh, but last time, as we introduced the study, we, we talked about this question uh, that Job asks in, in uh, the 28th chapter of Job, where shall wisdom be found? We read a lengthy passage there in uh, Job 28 and talked a little bit about it. We also looked at some texts, three or four different ones in the book of Proverbs. So uh, we're mostly in the Old Testament. We'll also be getting into some New Testament uh, texts at some point talking about this. Um, but uh, really talking about God being the source of wisdom and... Um, Seeking him is, is the way of finding wisdom and so forth in these passages that we considered last time. Um, we also said that this time we would be giving you some sort of summary thoughts on, on wisdom as it relates to creation. Remember that wisdom is tied up in creation and uh, that we would have seven summary thoughts on wisdom in creation, and we will get to that here in a bit. We're going to start off with some other things first, uh, but if you uh, printed the handout uh, off that uh, we sent out to you by, by email last time, we'll eventually get those blanks filled in for you as we move along. One thing I mentioned toward the end last time was uh, three of the Psalms, Psalm 8, Psalm 19, and Psalm 104. Encourage you to read over those and, and think about what they say about God and wisdom and creation. I thought I'd start with um, a little bit of that this time from the third psalm that I mentioned there, Psalm 104. It's a creation psalm and, as we'll see, a wisdom psalm. Uh, but, you know, it talks about the different acts of God in creation in sort of a poetic way throughout the psalm. It's a lengthy psalm. It says things like, he set the earth on its foundations that it should never be moved. Um, God made springs gush forth in the valleys that flow between the hills, cause grass to grow for the livestock. Uh, the trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, just uh, sort of surveying some of the verses in the psalm. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows it's time for setting. You make darkness and it is night and so forth. Uh, gets into some of the animals that God created as well. But right uh, in the middle of this psalm, in verse 24, the psalmist says, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. So right in the midst of this creation psalm, you have this statement that, that talks about how God made these things. And the psalmist's answer is, he made it in wisdom. And so uh, throughout the Old Testament, uh, throughout the scripture, we see uh, wisdom linked with creation and, 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 so, and uh, vice versa throughout. So um, I thought that was a good place for us to begin this time. And then uh, 
One other little piece I wanted to share with you, if I can find it. Um, a very important personality in, in wisdom literature in the Old Testament is uh, King Solomon. Uh, Solomon is associated with wisdom. I've heard him referred to as the, the fountainhead of wisdom in the Old Testament, although sadly uh, he did a lot of foolish things, uh, yet he was renowned for his wisdom. And one of the passages that that um, explains this or describes it is in 1 Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse 29. I just wanted to read this paragraph uh, to sort of get the name Solomon before us, and because we'll see it as we survey through different texts in the Old Testament, wisdom texts. Uh, 1 Kings 4, verse 29, it says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. Uh, in, in the ancient world, the East and Egypt both were associated with wisdom, thinking. Uh, and this text says Solomon's wisdom was even greater. Then it goes on in verse 31 says, For he was wiser than all men, wiser than Ethan, the Ezraite, and Heman, Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. But these names we don't know. Uh, but apparently the first readers would have known them as heroes of wisdom. And Solomon, of course, was greater. It then says, he also, Solomon, he also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and a fish. And the people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. And as I said, he is often associated with wisdom and wisdom uh, literature in the Old Testament and for good reason because God blessed him with incredible wisdom. Uh, that at points in his life he didn't take advantage of so he wasn't guaranteed uh, to be a wise person all the time just because God gifted him with wisdom at one point, which is something to keep in mind. Okay, so uh, before we get into our list of seven summary points, I uh, wanted to go through a little piece here that uh, might sound a little theoretical. Um, to me, it's really interesting and I've shared this with students before, and um, sometimes when I share it, I see some puzzled looks uh, at, at first, but uh, once we get through it, and especially with, with some perspective, it becomes uh, clear how important these thoughts are. It's a way of looking at wisdom literature that is helpful. Um, and so I'm going to go through it with you, and, and I hope you will benefit from it. But it's just sort of some preliminary thoughts on the origin of wisdom. And as we try to think of what wisdom is, where it came from, and that kind of thing, these can be helpful. One thing about wisdom literature, the wisdom books of the Old Testament that is different is that it's not dominated by history. Um, most of the Old Testament depends on the, the history of the patriarchs. So uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, their story, or uh, other facts of Israelite history, the Exodus, uh, references to the tabernacle, to the temple, or to the great king, King David, the ideal king. Most of the Bible, uh, is built on those historical people or events 
uh, not so much the wisdom books or the wisdom literature. Um, it's, it's less on history per se. Uh, what it does focus on are the events of what we might call prehistory, that is creation, the time before um, these people uh, that, that become heroes of the faith later. And so, you know, biblical wisdom is about the God of creation, sort of before he got local and personal and specific with people like Abraham and Moses and the nation of Israel and so forth. Its, its origins are before that. And uh, one of the things that's central that wisdom literature teaches is that there is an order to the cosmos. There is an order to the world, to the universe. Despite the fact that sometimes you have these random and unexplainable events that take place, which a lot of times we call chaos, uh, that there is this order to things, the way things ought to be. Uh, and this order is called chokhmah, that is wisdom, that word that we introduced last time. Uh, there is a, a scholar, a Jewish scholar named James Kugel, who has worked on this and he calls this order uh, that exists in the cosmos, he calls it the great plan. Obviously implied the great plan of God, but this is the way he refers to it. And he has an interesting way of suggesting how we think of the great plan. So here's where we get a little theoretical, but hopefully this picture will help us in... Uh, in understanding what we're reading here. He says, think of the great plan this way. Consider there is this immense, or imagine that there's this immense sheet of graph paper that stretches on infinitely. I've got a little piece of graph paper in case you're wondering what in the world is he talking about? If I can get a hold of it here, you know, something like this. But imagine one that stretches on infinitely and, um, and that graph paper contains the blueprint of all things, the, the blueprint of the universe, the cosmos, the world. And uh, he's, Kugel writes the following about this. Here are his words, quote, the great div divine plan that underlines all reality is like a detailed design drawn on graph paper. Since the graph paper is basically hidden, no one can ever hope to survey its entirety. But here and there, individual sages, that is wise people, individual sages here and there have caught a glimpse of one little part of it, one little square on the graph paper. Uh, and if we can preserve their insights one by one and eventually put them together, then we will nonetheless have something, some individual part of the divine plan. Perhaps we, we may even get some feeling for what the whole plan is like. And so Kugel, in trying to describe this, uh, suggests that chokhmah, wisdom, was sewn into the fabric of reality at the time of creation. That God wove wisdom into his creation and that this chokhmah, this wisdom, is revealed to and discovered by human beings bit by bit over time over the millennia since creation. And so in the way he's picturing this, each square, if you can see that, on the blueprint of the universe contains a single truth to be discovered about how life works and how God made the world. 
and humans are capable of discovering these truths. Every once in a while, they fill in one of the squares of truth. Uh, they either discover it or it is revealed to them uh, by God uh, as truth is revealed. And so there's all kinds of examples of truths, of course. For example, maybe one square is that two plus two equals four. A simple truth, uh, yet a discoverable one. Or maybe one of the squares states the truth E equals MC squared. One of the truths revealed through scientific investigation. Or how about um, a saying? For instance, you could complete this, I'm sure. If I say, what goes up, what's the rest of that? Must come down, right? What goes up must come down. A saying of truth. In the Bible, in a book like Proverbs, for instance, you have sayings like, pride goes before a fall. Well, that's a statement of truth. It's a small statement of truth, but it's just one of those little squares on the graph that represents all of reality. Uh, another saying in Proverbs, a proverb is, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. That's a poetic way of, of expressing a truth. It's not the only truth. Uh, but it is one. And, uh, you know, sometimes in, in, in the wisdom literature, the two, true, two truths will almost seem contradictory. Uh, for instance, there is a, a proverb that says, answer a fool according to his folly. And you know what the very next one says? Do not answer a fool according to his folly. Both those are true. Depends on the circumstance, but they're both one of those squares that we can fill in on the graph of reality uh, that has been observed and revealed over time. So that's sort of a, a way of picturing what we're dealing with here. And then to add this, each of the wisdom books, each of the mi major wisdom books in the Old Testament deals with this blueprint or graph in a different way. Excuse me, I had a phone call coming in. Uh, it, it deals with the graph in, in a different way. It handles the grand plan differently. And that's what makes each one different and interesting in its own way. And that's important to realize before you actually plow in, start reading them and studying them, I think. For example, the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs itself, how does it deal with reality and truth and so forth? Well, Proverbs deals with it very optimistically. That is, Proverbs approaches truth this way. It says, you can discover... <laughs> You can state it in very clear, concise ways that can be counted on and relied on. Uh, and that's the nature of Proverbs. If you just sort of thumb through the book of Proverbs, you see how this is done. For instance, I'm just randomly opening to a proverb. It says, a man of quick temper acts foolishly and a man of evil devices is hated. Okay, it's a quick, uh, specific statement of a single truth. Uh, another one says, a truthful witness saves lives, but one who breathes out lies is deceitful. Uh, wealth brings many new friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friend. Uh, I think you can see in that one that, uh, is that true 100% of the time? No, but it often is. And that's sort of the nature of these. A foolish son is a ruin to his father. Uh, 
slothfulness, cast into a deep sleep. Those are the way Proverbs sound. And again, you have these statements one after the other, one not necessarily connected to the next, but they're statements of truth. Proverbs deals with the grand plan very optimistically. It says we can discover truth, and here it is stated very clearly, concisely, and memorably. That's what the book of Proverbs is like. On the other hand, you have a book like Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is much more pessimistic. In fact, that if I were going to use one word to describe it, uh, it's pessimistic for the most part, at least 90% of it. So Ecclesiastes' approach to the grand plan is, yes, there's such a plan, but good luck finding it because the plan is covered by a thick mist. Just to show how this works, the opening words of the book of Ecclesiastes. Chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And then here it is. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So Ecclesiastes, and its, its approach to discovering truth and the way life ought to be is quite pessimistic. It says there's a, there is a plan, but it's really hard to find because it's covered by this fog, this mist that's called vanity. And it almost totally obscures our ability to discover and observe it. Ecclesiastes is a lot different than Proverbs. And if you read Proverbs and Ecclesiastes in the exact same way, you won't get the message that was intended. It's important to, to think of these things really before uh, we plow into these books. And then one other, the book of uh, Job. Job is, is different than Proverbs and different than Ecclesiastes in that it tells a story, uh, a story about a man, Job, who sort of goes on this adventure, this life adventure with God. And uh, you are likely familiar with the story of Job and his suffering and, and his interaction with his friends and so forth. Uh, but by the time we, we read all the way through Job, we find a guy who has, for a brief moment, been allowed to see the great plan. God, at the end of Job, speaks to him and shows him incredible things. And, and, um, and, and you know, God lets him in to many of the secrets of the universe. But he also finds out, Job does, that the grand plan includes a square, remember our graph paper, a square or maybe many squares for something that the writers of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes never imagined, a square called chaos. And you know, chaos is the very thing that the creator, God, vanquished mostly during creation week. Do you remember how the Bible opens? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So far, so good. What's it say next? And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Without form, void, and darkness, those are all chaos words. And, and God then, in the rest of the creation account, begins to set things in order, day one, day two, and so forth. Let there be light, right? He organizes the waters and the land. And so he mostly dispels chaos. 
But Job will find out that there's still a little chaos in the world when God shows up and explains to him what's been going on in his life. Job is a, a totally different approach to the search, the quest for wisdom. And it's important to keep that in mind uh, before we plow into Job. And so each wisdom book, and, and there are others as well that we won't talk about now, uh, approaches it in a little bit different way, a little bit different fashion, and it's helpful to keep those in mind um, as we approach them. So let's go back to where, what I promised after last time, and that was to sort of summarize some important thoughts on wisdom in creation. And uh, we picked seven summary thoughts because seven is a great biblical num number for completeness. So uh, although these may not be every important point, they're a good representation. Summary thoughts on wisdom in creation. And these will rehash uh, many of the things we've said in these first couple of, of uh, sessions. Number one, God is the source and giver of wisdom. It's not coming from any place else. He is the source and giver of wisdom. Number two, wisdom is part of the fabric of creation. So we talked about that a little last time and a little this time. God sort of sowed into creation wisdom. Uh, by wisdom, he founded the earth. And in wisdom, he created. And so it's part of the mix of what God made when he made the, the earth and the world, the universe. Wisdom is part of the fabric of creation. Number three, going quickly. Three is that, that wisdom's role is to give order and structure to life in this world, as God did when he created the world. So wisdom strives to, to bring order from disorder and chaos. And you can really see this in the book of Proverbs when you read these statements about life, you know, um, about the danger of pride and, and the way you handle money and different things. You sort of see how if you behave in, this, in these wise ways, you can avoid chaos and destruction. So that's the role uh, of wisdom. It's to bring order and structure. It's, it's to live life the way it was meant to be lived, in other words. And God sowed that into his creation and made it a part of reality in his world. Number four, summary thoughts on wisdom in creation. Number four is, we haven't talked so much about uh, all the rest of these, but we will. God is involved in his world, working on it from within, not without. Okay? God did not create the world and then leave it, never to interact with it again. Uh, there are some philosophers and uh, teachers that suggest that's the way it was done. Uh, they're normally called deists. But what we're suggesting and, and teaching here is that God is involved in his creation, in his world. He is working and he is in the midst of it. It's not as if he, he's sitting safely in heaven and letting us try and figure it out. No, God became flesh and walked among us. And, uh, and so he, he is working and involved. That's an important thought uh, point in, in understanding wisdom. And five is related to that, and that is that God is a relational God. He desires, wants to be in relationship with his creation. And uh, that explains a lot of things about how he acts. So that's number five. Number six, 
God has established a relationship with a community. Um, the divine assembly, Israel, and later the new Israel, the church, um, because God is relational, he has established a relationship with a people. And, and this tells us something about how he uh, relays wisdom and demonstrates it to his creation. And then finally, number seven, God has created an interrelated world, an interrelated world. There is a, sort of a spider web of relationships in this world. And so, and we see this come out in wisdom literature. What I mean is that how I live affects you and vice versa. How I live and conduct myself affects others. Uh, we could just multiply the examples of that, could we not, how that works. Uh, I am not an island to myself. What I do matters to others. My evil act can throw an entire nation into chaos, can it not? We have seen that. Uh, my good sacrificial act can inspire people and make them want to do better. We see that most of all in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God has created this world not of isolated individuals, but interrelated. And we have this web of relationships that affect one another. And so what I do, think, say, matters, and as it does for you as well. So these are the seven summary thoughts, some of which we've talked about um, in these first two sessions and, and more that we'll see as we go along. Um, again, a lot of this was for laying groundwork and, and, and uh, a little bit of theory, wisdom theory, we might call it, but I hope it's helpful as we think about the way these different books in the Old Testament uh, proclaim the truth of God. And uh, I hope you will uh, look forward now to reading them a little more closely and, and seeing what they have to say to us, helping us in our quest for for this precious commodity of wisdom uh, in our world. It's, it's so deeply needed by all of us. Thank you again for tuning in. And uh, please let me know your thoughts and comments and questions you might have uh, for future study. God bless you today. And uh, please be a blessing to someone else as you have opportunity. We'll see you next time.